Hey everybody, I want to just very quickly talk about the season 6 premiere of Game of Thrones, The Red Woman, which was on last night. Uh, I have a little bit to talk about. First of all, uh, as Alan Sepinwall very wonderfully put it, The Red Woman sets the table. And she certainly does. This episode was a lot of setup. A lot of things I was hoping to see tonight, you know, Jon Snow resurrected, or, um, you know, Jamie and the Zombie Mountain wreaking revenge on the Sparrows. I was looking forward to that scene. The issue that I'm having right now is that I'm actually in a position where I'm rooting for the Lannisters, and I feel like I really want to see Cersei get a revenge. I never thought I would feel that way. Uh, I was having a hard time enjoying the show the last few years because I was just so hooked on getting revenge for Ned Stark and Rob Stark, the North Remembers. But it's just not going to happen, at least not right now. So to get some enjoyment out of the show, I think I'm going to just root for Cersei and Jamie just for right now and get rid of the sparrows. And uh, the Lannisters will be in you know, such a weakened position, I think, after this that um, whether the uh, Sand Snakes there from Dorne come over or if Danny actually gets her ships back, uh, there will be nothing left of them to fight back. I mean, that's just kind of a rough guess at this point. But uh, rooting for the Zombie Mountain, I mean... Who can't get behind that? So let's first talk about Danny. Um, I really feel like this bit with her and the Dothraki will drag on. Get it? Dragon. Um, I was disappointed that uh, he didn't cut her dress. It's been a while since we... But it's okay. I know she's not into that anymore. It's totally fine. She did a good bit of posturing, um, you know, where she's saying, I'm Daenerys Stormborn of the House Targaryen, all in, in, in ancient Valerian. Or was she speaking Dothraki? Someone can probably leave me a comment, and they know for sure. Um, but her words, you know, a millionth of her name, Queen of Nothing, they held very little power. And it wasn't until she name-checked Khal Drogo that it basically spared her a pretty horrible couple of days. Uh, and But now she's going to be taken back to Vyas Dothrak, where she's going to sit and be one of the soothsayers that previously predicted that uh, her son with Drogo would be the stallion that mounted the world and lit it on fire or whatever they said. Uh, so she's going to have to get out of that situation. Really funny bit when the call was talking to his uh, men about the the, you know, the best thing in life, seeing a beautiful woman naked for the first time, and they and, and he said, "Well, what about breaking a horse for the first time, or what about going into battle, or whatever it was?" And he's like, "All right, it is one of the five best things in life." Uh, that that was a pretty well done scene. I I did enjoy that. So uh, the Dothraki are cool, but I've um, been wondering what happened to the rest of Drogo's Colossar, the few that were still loyal to uh, Danny when they were lost in the Red Waste or whatever. Um, once she got the army of Unsullied, I don't think we'd see them anymore. Maybe someone could leave me a comment and correct me, but um, if the people of Marine want Danny gone so badly, why did they burn her ships? Why not say, you know, get out of here, go take your throne back, and we will uh, you know, be just fine without you. We'll be happier without you. Strange, because without those ships, she's stuck in Essos for God knows how long. The fact that he could find that ring in the tall grass, not idly to the leaves of Lorien Fall, am I right? You Lord of the Rings guys, you know what I'm talking about. I just picked up um, Shadow of Mordor on Steam for $12.99. Look, look for that Let's Play. Subscribe now. You don't miss any updates. Um, so let's talk about Arya for a minute. She was blinded by the many-faced god as a sort of penance for taking the life uh, that was not hers to take. So now she's going to be like a Luke Skywalker, and she's going to be kind of you know growing her powers as the waif uh, teaches her to fight without sight. I'm not sure how that ties into the mythology, but we're going to learn uh, her process and everything like that. It's not that interesting to me, but I'm curious to see what kind of a demigod she turns into by season's end. Um, in Dorne, the Sand Snake woman there, the, the sister, was chastising the, the old king for not leaving the palace and not leaving the grounds. But I could chastise the screenwriters for the same for the same thing because we haven't seen much of Dorne at all. We saw a little bit of the beach, and it's been primarily inside those palace walls. I know HBO has a limited budget, but still, I don't really care that much about Dorne. Sansa Enrique, excuse me, Theon Greyjoy. Uh, I thought it was going to be lazy writing if they were recaptured and just brought right back to Winterfell, but... Uh, luckily, uh, in not a day of sex machina, uh, Captain Phasma shows up and saves the day. It made perfect sense. She was just done killing my boy Stannis, uh, the one true king. But she came out of uh, the woods and she killed the Bolton hunting party. And even Podrick got a couple good shots in. It was a really good scene. It made sense that they were there because they were actually in the area. And now she has fulfilled her oath to both Renly and to Catelyn Stark to protect her daughter. And in a really touching scene, um, 
Sansa is able to collect herself enough to actually accept the oath and repeat part of it back to her with a little bit of help from Podrick. I thought that was a really powerful scene. But that, that was the high point of the episode for me, was actually seeing the Bolton uh, party um, killed off by one of the few remaining good guys on the show, of course, Brienne Bri- of Tarth. Interesting bit about Ramsay as well, that the Kettleman's daughter, who he remarked always smelled of dog, uh, became Puppy Chow. I thought that was kind of poetic for such a, well, just such a cruel bitch as Miranda. Uh, finally, to the wall. Uh, I do like that John's friends and Davos know that uh, death awaits them outside that door. I love the line, if you are expecting to see tomorrow, you're in the wrong room. That was good. And I was expecting that to be resolved. I thought that midnight deadline, I thought we were going to see what happens there. And they were going to go get the um, wildlings to come back and maybe Melisandre would do something. Davos very forebodingly says, you haven't seen her do what I've seen her do. So I think that means that she's not done. And the titular red woman, uh, even though she turned into something out of room 237, out of the Overlook Hotel, we haven't seen her do uh, everything she's capable of yet. She's still full of surprises. So even though it seems as though she's lost her faith and she's done, and she's done with the Lord of Light, uh, maybe she's got some fight left in her. Maybe she will bring back Jon Snow. Or if not, you know, maybe she's done as a character. I'm not sure. So next week, will we see the return of Bran and Hodor? Will we ever see Rickon again? Will we find out what happened to him? Uh, do we even care? Uh, has Melisandre given up permanently? Or is she, does she still have some faith left? In her, uh, will we ever get the image of her crawling naked into that bed out of our heads? I, I don't, I'd like to think that maybe there's hope. So we will see you next week, and thanks very much for watching.